Okay, great. Okay. So, uh, welcome everybody to um, the Save the Great South Bay Bay Friendly Yards Rewilding Long Island, uh, the Zoom call. We are very happy to be here tonight with several of our um, distinguished panelists. Um, a little bit about our organization to get started. Save the Great South Bay was founded in 2013 by two Sable, um, two Sable High School uh, uh, Sable residents who met up at a high school reunion and had seen what had happened to the bay and were appalled at the, at the state of the bay and vowed that night to do something about it. And, and that's our organization was born. We're now um, seven years on. We are 15,000 members strong. And uh, we are made up of uh, fishermen, paddle boarders, um, nonprofit organizations, municipal partners, a ton of volunteers, um, educational partners, school, all the same uh, passion for preserving the Great South Bay for future generations to enjoy. So I welcome everybody tonight and thank you for joining us on this conversation. The three main focus areas for Save the Great South Bay our uh, Creek Defender program. Well, I'm, going nuts. I'm just going to ask everybody who is not on the panel to please that mute. Down there. If you can hit that, I don't know. I think um, we somebody. can actually, if host mutes all, I it's think that should go. No, it's not. Well, Terrific, thank you so much. Um, so as I was saying, the, we have three main focus areas here at Save the Great South Bay. One being the Creek Defender Program where uh, we appoint a Creek Defender across the 16 towns and villages along the South Shore of Long Island to patrol and protect the 50 creeks and rivers that run into the Great South Bay. Um, the bay will only be as healthy as the water that runs into it. Our second and more recent initiative is the Great South Bay Oyster Project, where we are working together with several municipalities and other partners to restore shellfish oysters in particular, populations in the bay. Oysters are a great natural filter, filter system. And our third, um, the third direction of our organization is what we're here to talk about tonight. It's a very important part of our work, and that is habitat restoration. And you know, what does habitat restoration really mean? And what does a butterfly really have to do with saving the Great South Bay? Well, I hope that'll become clearer for everybody tonight with our panelists in this open discussion. Um, but we are going to talk about how those two things are connected and how um, habitat restoration really is what our island would look like or what pieces of our island would look like if we weren't here. So with that, I would like to welcome our um, distinguished panelists and, um, and uh, our host, the Greater Sable Civic Association. Christine Charney has been instrumental in helping us pull this together. So thank you, Christine. Really appreciate all your efforts on that. Uh, a quick shout out to our, um, our sponsors for this evening's program, which include the Lessings Hospitality Group, who have over nine Main Street restaurants. They are a big supporter of our organization as well as Blue Point Brewing, who has even created a label called Drink the Bay Clean, that helps, uh, the proceeds of which help support our organization's efforts. So here with me tonight, um, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Raju Rajan, who is the current president of Rewild Long Island, an organization based up on the North Shore. Hi, Raju. Um, whose efforts um, focus on, on habitat restoration. Uh, Hilda, Paul's daughter, who is a, a co-founder of the organization and served as the communications director. Good evening, Hilda. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Uh, Matt Gettinger, a good friend of our organization and longtime supporter. Um, he is the owner of Long Island Natives, a, a, um, a nursery out in Eastport, New York, out on the east end of Long Island, that focuses on bringing native plants to our, to our local gardens. And of course, Frank Piccinini, uh, habitat director at uh, Save the Great South Bay and co-founder of Simple Consulting, which is a native okay. landscaping company. So thank you, Matt and Frank, for joining us tonight. Yeah, of course. Happy to be here. Really great. So um, I'm going to kick it off with a very simple question of uh, how do we, you know, put a framework around or how do you define sustainable landscaping? And uh, Raju, I'm going to ask if you will 
hit that question first? Sure. I mean, you know, the, the, the way I think about it is in, in terms of landscaping, we are where the organic movement was in like the late 80s, early 90s, where it's like, you know, a bunch of, sorry for my fellow panelists, but a bunch of hippies <laughs> sitting around and saying, hey, you know, wouldn't it be cool if our food were chemical free and pesticide free and locally grown? We are doing the same thing to our landscape. Now you're asking the question, hey, why are we re re replicating these industrial modes of production where, you know, somebody has to bring a machine and make a lawn for you that looks just like the lawn of your neighbor and everybody else and looks like McDonald's could be serving up lawns, right? And you could be like standing in line for happy lawn meals. <laughs> so that's what our landscape looks like. And, and you know, if, if, if it were just a human problem, that would be one thing but it's also a huge biodiversity problem because what looks to us like a weed or what looks to us like a native plant that needs to be removed uh, is, is food for the butterfly, for the, for the bee, for the bird. And, and since the landscapes we are putting in are artificial or at least not native to here, we have to do a huge amount of uh, work to sustain them. And that work comes in the form of chemical fertilizers in form of fracking, which then produces the urea on one hand and the gasoline on the other hand. It needs huge amounts of immigrant labor, uh, largely, right, to, to maintain this system uh, in order to give you a cost-effective, reproducible product that time after time comes out exactly looking the same. And we are questioning, right? I mean, right now, like just like the organic movement questioned that we should be growing food in those ways and, and feeding ourselves poison, we are asking ourselves the question, hey, should we be growing lawns or growing landscapes the way we are right now? Um, uh, uh, or should we be moving to a more sustainable mode of production that's good, better for us and better for the environment and better for um, the South Bay <laughs> and the North Shore and everything, right? Yeah, and I, I would like to add to this. Thanks, Raju. Um, is there an echo to my voice? Um, so um, in terms of sustainable, it's, um, we're, past that point unfortunately i'm i'm sorry to bring up the point that it's too late to be sustainable we need to regenerate we need to restore and renew the soil we're standing on uh, right now in this moment we're losing 24 billion tons of soil topsoil the the uppermost la layer of earth that's actually capturing the sunlight and photosynthesizing. So that's where we get our oxygen from. And there's a disconnect. Um, we're losing 24 billion tons a year of topsoil. And if anybody's interested in reading more, this is my favorite book. You can't really see it maybe here. I'll put it in the, in the comment section. It's Dirt, The Erosion of Civilization is the title. And um, in this book, it's uh, a soil scientist, David uh, Montgomery. He mentions that every year, so if a couple of tons of topsoil are lost per person, we have right now, we have an estimate 24 billion tons a year. It's growing due to intensive agricultural practices and the way we manage the land land management in general, our behaviors. So we're losing, as the sea levels are rising, we're losing the land we're standing on. That's significant. So how can we, how can we bind the soil? Grass only does so much. The deep-rooted native plants reach much deeper than anything that you're insisting on growing in the soil here. So the deep-rooted native plants will help bind the soil. Um, any type of no-till type of agriculture. So when we go to the store, knowing the source of the food we're eating, even um, insisting on practices, animal husbandry is a real problem. Um, we have to know where our food is coming from. The, we basically have to reduce or refuse industrial factory farms. Um, it is a sad news for um, a lot of our culture, but we are what we eat and we're eating the, the land we're standing on. 
we have to be mindful of that. Um, in that. On that note, the UN predicts we have about 60 harvests left. And I, I don't know why that's not front news um, material because it's significant. So we're, we're losing the fertile layer of land that we rely on for capturing sunlight and creating oxygen, and in the meantime, feeding people. And that's due to industrial processes. So to me, the only way forward is um, the big C, compost. It's not sexy, it's not exciting. It's actually an ancient technique of converting food waste into soil and fertilizing the soil naturally quite naturally. And I'm doing this in my own house, and I know Rashu is doing that too. I'm binding the soil with plants, native plants. And I was very, very fortunate to have done that two years ago, because at the beginning of summer, I broke my foot. So I couldn't tend to my garden as I wanted to, as a gardener. I wanted to tend to my garden, but I couldn't. But thankfully, I planted early enough that the plants now are taking care of themselves. So I could sit outside and just watch them grow and they outcompete the weeds. I don't have um, any type of watering mechanism. I don't have um, any type of sprinkler. I will, I will uh, just do it myself by hand if, if there is need, but I couldn't get to it on my crutches. So I just sat there and, and wondered how they do and they're doing terrific. I have my New York Iron wheat standing tall, seven, eight feet tall. It's um, stood the storm that uprooted trees. It just sways in the wind and it goes, it runs so deep, it's binding and regenerating. And when I moved to my land here, um, we had sandy soil. It was really a uh, dad kind of. And then Rashu came here and, 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 and we put a ton of mulch on top of of cardboard from Costco <laughs> mm -hmm. and we killed the lawn um, with you know respect to the lawn but understanding that what we're doing is regenerating the land. Thank you Hilda, thank you so much. Frank, would you like to chime in here on, um, I know some of the projects that we've recently worked on together um, with habitat restoration here in, in uh, Babylon Village, you had a quite a significant um, uh, turn up of, I'm going to say, caterpillars and butterflies in a very short amount of time. Would you like to speak to how restoring our habitat ties into the, the biodiversity? Yeah, so, so biodiversity, I, I mean, it, it's interesting. There's, there's, a broad, um, there's a broad array of life that actually exists in all of our backyards. Um, but unfortunately, uh, we, we just don't, a lot of people are just not cognizant of it. And further, because we've, uh, we've created these industrialized landscapes where we have you know, a bunch of statues, effect statues effectively, right? Um, these exotic plants that insects don't, uh, don't look at and don't really host on, um, and just these, this, all of this lawn that's effectively concrete. Uh, we, I, myself included, we grew up in these sterile, life, sterile, lifeless monocultures of lawn. We didn't realize how silent it was outside, or at least I didn't as a kid growing up, growing up in North Massapequa. So, you know, it's absolutely amazing to me um, how quickly uh, wildlife and fish responds to just mm -hmm. putting some native plants in, right? So on, on a lot of these jobs that, I, that I'm working on, we get a plant delivery, we're laying them out. And we have monarch caterpillar, uh, butterflies rather, visiting the, the blooms of the milkweed and some of these other uh, po pollinator favorite plants before they're even in the ground. Uh, so we planted butterfly milkweed this midsummer in the Babylon uh, plot. And, and to your point, you know, we had a ton of monarch caterpillars uh, running, off, running around and you know, eating the milkweed that we planted. So it's really gratifying to, to do something that really uh, allows nature to respond in that way. Yeah, I've seen, I've recently read um, Douglas Talamay's Nature's Best Hope. Um, Matt, have you read that book? Oh, you're on you, Matt. So I've yet to read that one. I, uh, I mean, I'm a big fan of Doug Talamay. I actually went to the University of Delaware as well. I've, I've read Bringing Nature Home. I know it's gotta be, I don't know, at least a decade ago, 12 years ago. 
Yeah, I feel I feel like the um, nature's best hope is is basically an outline. It's a blueprint for how we can restore habitat one yard at a time or one little piece of land at a time. You know, from um, uh, to, to create like a patchwork, a quilt of um, restored habitat that the the birds and the bees can return to. So, what are you seeing out uh, trends wise out by you, Matt, at Long Island Natives? Yeah, I mean, we've, uh, you know, really uh, been happy, proud um, to be able to provide plant materials for these types of projects and all the efforts of the organizations such as yours and such as Rogers as well. And um, they're really critically important to the balancing act that is sustainable landscaping. And, you know, kind of to go back to what you were mentioning before about what is sustainable landscaping to me. It's ethical land management. It's a balance. It's promoting biological practices that are going to stimulate, they're going to add to the biological activity of all of our, of our land in general. And, you know, through these efforts and through the awareness of individuals such as, you know, Doug Tallamy and several others that have come before him and um, several others that are, that are also uh, doing their part in increasing awareness by putting out publications, books, and and bringing the science to, to kind of Main Street, um, we've seen you know, a huge response to people actively seeking out native plants. Uh, one of the things that we've done or had to do quite honestly, just based on the demand was open up an online only store just to be able to give uh, you know, homeowners, consumers an outlet that are trying to kind of follow these guidelines um, and, and bring nature home and, 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 and Kind of support and bring back that biological activity to their properties and there really wasn't an outlet um, where these consumers could find what they were looking for and certainly not on a local level uh, and so when that opportunity presented itself um, you know as a nursery owner we we looked at it and said this just makes too much sense to not do and it's it's really gratifying i must say to be able to work on the projects that we work on to provide plant material that's you know, indigenous uh, and, and can restore these so very important plant communities uh, and kind of restore that balance. So whether it be a you know, large commercial application or a, a national park or a state park for that matter, um, you know, all of these are opportunities for us to kind of restore that biological uh, activity and do some of the things that we're talking about um, environmentally, uh, whether it be stormwater mitigation, whether it be just um, a better use of uh, you know, uh, capturing carbon out of the atmosphere or reducing nitrogen use or capturing ni uh, nitrogen. Uh, all these projects um, are so, so critically important and will continue to be important over the next, you know, over, over our lifetimes um, if we are to be successful um, and as if we are to be good stewards uh, of, of the land that, you know, we need to take care of it so it can take care of us, right? Yeah, so Frank, I'm gonna swing back to you. Um, here at Save the Great South Bay, we run the Bay Friendly Yard, the certification program. And I think there, it's very similar to the rewilding um, program. Um, there are three basic tenets to that program. Would you go into those? Uh, yeah, and, uh, and, and you're right. It is very similar to the rewilding program. And uh, the first time I actually met Hilder, we were on a similar Zoom call. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we chuckled and said, let's meet in the middle, right? Uh, so it's, it's, we're, we're working on the South Shore. They're largely up north, but they're starting to be everywhere um, as, as we are. Um, so the Bay Friendly Yard Program, it has three major components. And, and this is really, uh, it goes back to the first question, what is sustainable landscaping, right? So the, the first thing is stormwater management. Uh, so the idea of keeping water on your property, as opposed to letting it run off into the, onto the streets, into the storm drains, directly into the Great South Bay or whatever other receiving water body. Um, we want to keep it, uh, within the, the boundaries, the four corners of your plot. Uh, and grass doesn't do it. From a stormwater standpoint, grass is effectively concrete, particularly in the winter. Um, so, you know, it runs off. So uh, keep, keeping stormwater on your site, and there's a lot of different ways to do it. So the first way to do it is just uh, planting native plants, having a garden, putting a grove of trees um, with the, the plant material actually holds on to that water through evapotranspiration and um, the root action actually increases soil porosity, basically the sponginess of the soil. Um, so that's, that's the first component, stormwater management. The second component is habitat restoration, which is really 
sort of a catch-all. Um, there's, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Uh, first, it's just having an inventory of your site and removing invasive plants, uh, replacing with native plants, uh, putting communities together uh, in connect, in having, you know, knitting together uh, ecological communities as opposed to just having a token plant here and there. Um, and the third thing is stewardship. Uh, and, and, that's, and that's sort of the land ethic that, that Matt spoke to. Um, it's the long-term commitment to stewarding the land. So, you know, not using chemicals, not using pesticides, not using plants that don't need further irrigation, uh, stuff like, and, and continuous removal of invasive species because those stinkers pop up all over the place. No matter how many you pull, um, they continue, you know, there's, there's bittersweet all over. Um, so those three components, um, there's not a lot of daylight between them. They kind of overlap, but they're sort of also discrete um, areas that, that we ask our Bay from the Yards participants to kind of evidence how they're uh, doing each of these practices. Thank you, thank you. Raju, can you tell us about some of the um, habitat restoration programs that, you, that, that Rewild Long Island has been involved in? And are the majority of them um, municipal projects versus homeowner projects, or are you finding it uh, across the board? You know, I think people who are on the call today already have an extreme interest in this, in this topic. Um, that's why they're spending their time with us tonight. But you know, how do we get that message out to, you know, how do we spread the message that you know, restoring habitat is a really critical part of, of you know, being residents of Long Island? So there's two sides to it, right? One is the public, public pieces of land that we communally own or large pieces of land that institutions own. And the other is our private homes and yards. I always start with our private homes and yards because we have a lot more control there. And, and it's a much easier thing to say, okay, look, rather than um, try to get a big effort going, can I go and plant something today? And, and, and exactly as Frank said right there, there are three very basic things that we try to get people to do and try to make it easy for people to do. It's not, I'm not gonna say somehow that, you know, people haven't gotten a religion or something, most people want to live in a chemical-free, uh, bio-friendly, eco-friendly way. Um, it's just that the way the industry is aligned, the way things are aligned, it's just easier to um, get get somebody to come in and uh, you know sort of like whatever blow and uh, mow your lawn, right? Than to get some native plant specialist to come in and give you all the advice. So there are three basics that we come down to, right? Very simple. Do you have native plants? Can you put in a few? Don't you don't need to look for perfection. Just look for a little bit of improvement, maybe take you know, four square feet of ground, eight square feet, 100 square feet, whatever you can do. Take a small piece of land, um, put some cardboard and mulch on it, maybe put some, put some few plants on, put some native plants on it and start growing your native plant base. Second is grow your own organic food, even if it is one tomato plant or one eggplant or whatever it is, it's very synergistic because the insects that'll come to pollinate or uh, hover around the native plants do really so well, and I can tell you my organic garden, really, it's like bursting with life ever since I put, a na put native plants in, simply because the bees don't miss a single flower, right? So my yield is like through the roof. Um, the third is compost, exactly what uh, Hilder said, which is don't let your yard waste go out because it's gonna come back to you as fertilizer tracked from some chemical, right? So don't get rid of that nitrogen and carbon which you're throwing on the street. It's really like the food for your insects and plants that's going to come back and give you organic food and give you better native plants. So if you have these three practices to get down, together with what Frank was saying about, you know, maybe having rain barrels and not having water runoff, you're pretty good. You're making a very good start there. And if we could get, you know, a thousand homes across Long Island to do that, that could be as much as, you know, 30, 40 acres of land, right? So rather than think in terms of, oh my God, we need to go and get this preserve to do this thing that they are not doing and fight the invasives, why not get a thousand of our neighbors to commit to doing something very basic, which is grow native plants, grow some organic food, and um, you know, practice uh, uh, composting, bokashi, things like that to keep the uh, waste from going out. The other side of it is exactly what we do in our public spaces. Uh, wh what we do there is less restoration than right now. There are a lot of uh, 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 you know churches or uh, libraries. There are very many friendly spaces which lack the volunteer base and the knowledge and the expertise to put native plants in. So very often what we do is we work with private landowners and when we help them, we make a little bit of money from them and we usually put it into public spaces. That's kind of what our philosophy has been is to help 
our neighbors, like make it easier. And so uh, I should say uh, we are getting plants for over, uh, native plants for over 70 people uh, have signed up for native plants and we're procuring them, thankfully from Matt. So we're gonna have a lot of very, very happy homeowners. <laughs> so, so it's, it's an ecosystem. So again, right, we, it's not just the ecosystem of the plants, but it is also the ecosystem of the people. We need to promote people who are native plant consultants. We need to help our growers, native plant growers. We need to make sure that uh, our, our local stores carry native plants. So it's all that. It's, it's that intricate web of both commerce and relationships that connect us. That ecosystem also we have to pay attention to. So that's kind of how we operate, which is helping private owner, homeowners with knowledge and uh, resources and expertise uh, while trying to help public spaces, you know, restore their habitat or add new habitat um, uh, as we go along. Thank you, Raju. I find it also, I, I walk around or I drive around and I see all these little spaces that, you know, that I can identify as these are potential, you know, yep. At Save the Greats out there, we have a project where we want to achieve 50 acres of uh, restored habitat by the end of the year. And so all these little pieces, they add together to create, um, to create this patchwork that will all add up to that 50 acres at the end of the year. Yep, but I, I liken, I've likened it in our last um, Zoom call, and I'll say it again. Um, and as a person who is relatively new to native planting, it's like walking into the wine shop and you have all these different wines to choose from. And you always go back and you choose the one that you know already because it's familiar. So Matt, how do we help people um, identify, you know, a plant this, not that, um, a type of scenario? How do we, you know, where does somebody start as, a, you know, where does somebody start to restore habitat? Sure, absolutely. I mean. I think it can be as simple as starting with a few basic plants or, or areas that you've identified on your property that, you know, where you've, you've identified you don't need perhaps a more traditional, typical lawn area. And you can start small with those areas. And then start with what, you know, what makes sense for that particular area on your property. And that's the beauty of, of native plants is everybody's property is different. Just because we live on Long Island, there's a lot of different ecosystems. There's a lot of different habitats across Long Island. And the key to understanding how all this works is understanding with what would be found naturally occurring on your property or near your property uh, with your soil type, with your hydrology, with the other plant communities that uh, would have been naturally occurring there. And how can you kind of recreate um, the, the, the habitat that would have been found there using those attributes? And that's the easiest way to get started because what works in one person's yard might be completely different than somebody else's. There are native plants that prefer wet. There are native preferred plants that prefer dry. So, you know, taking into consideration all these variables, one of the best things you can do, you know, aside from, and I, one thing I will say about the audience um, that typically contacts our nursery and the audience that, uh, you know, that I find volunteering uh, for, for organizations like Save the Great South Bay and others is that they are very studious. They are very well educated. Um, you guys are the experts, quite frankly. I learn more from our customers, consumers, um, and those passionate hobbyists than I do typically from, you know, from, from myself or my team or, or, or my background or my education. So, um, you know, the thing that I would say is that a lot of you guys have a great head start, and that's because you're passionate about the, the subject matter. And that passion leads to education and it leads to, you know, really a better understanding of, um, uh, like I said, of, of what plants make the most sense for your particular yard. And the other thing that I, uh, that I should recommend is that, you know, there are great professionals in the industry that have this native plant knowledge. And, you know, I would definitely encourage people to seek out those individuals, uh, professionals that, you know, are not doing this for the first time, um, that have some experience with working with native plants or, uh, you know, the, the recreation of habitat. And you know, pick their brains, and uh, you know, they're, they're, there's a reason that they're professionals out there, and you know, you get what you pay for. So, um, if you can find a certified nursery landscape professional uh, that has experience with dealing with native plants, um, you know, that would be my recommendation. But a lot of you guys are do-it-yourselfers, and I'm and I'm all for that. And um, there's a beauty in that. And you know, I think Raju said it's you know it's very gratifying, just like it is to grow your own food. So. Um, there, there's a lot of different resources out there and I'd be happy to supply some links to some, um, some of the ones that can be most helpful, but, you know, professionals are out there, seek their advice 
And if you're going to do it yourself, um, you know, I encourage you to just do a little bit of research into where you live, what is naturally occurring, what can be found, what is your hydrology type. Just a little bit of details there can really help you uh, pick the right plants for your property. I just uh, Can I just uh, add just like two thoughts on that uh, as far as just individual homeowners getting started? Um, and, and Matt, that was, that was great. Um, I, I think the, the two things I would say is, is take the cues from your yard. If you can learn, have a little bit of plant knowledge and figure out what's, what's native that's already volunteering in your yard, you could start to understand the ecological properties, uh, the wetland tolerance, the shade tolerance, the drought tolerance, all the natural history of those plants that are native that are already living in your yard, and then find plants that are similar to those plants and, and just kind of stick them in. Uh, don't don't uh, be afraid to, uh, you know, you have a plant or two die that stinks, but, you know, don't be afraid to experiment. Um, and, and the last thing is uh, audition your plants. So if you're going to, don't buy 10 flats of one thing that you think might do well, um, just, just buy one or two gallon pots, stick mm -hmm. it in, see how it does for a summer. And if it thrives, then buy more of them, put them in the next year. That's just a, a couple pointers from my point of view. Thanks, thanks. So Hilder, could you um, give us some, a little bit of background on, um, for people who are maybe new to the topic? And I'll be honest, it took me a while to understand the differences between them too, but maybe you could speak to the differences between what's a native plant, what's an exotic plant, and what's an invasive plant, because native plants can also be invasive. Is that correct? Absolutely, yes. And uh, I just gave Frank a virtual clap. Did you see that? <laughs> If we were in the same room, I would have stood up and clapped for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Elder. Yeah, and everybody here. Just, uh, I noticed the chat box. I wanted to m make note of Raju. Uh, uh, I will actually share this link. We have experts who are uh, landscape developers as well here on the North Shore, but I believe most of, the, um, most of us here are, are on the South Shore here. I, I'm not sure about the color base today, but the uh, in terms of invasives, I, for example, am non-native, non-invasive. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I had two kids and I stopped. Um, so, uh, no, I'm not going to get <laughs> into that, but there is a way. Um, so, native plants that take over large areas are invasive, right? And then uh, we have examples of, for example, the Norway maple. To me, that's a weed. It's a non-native that takes over, uh, removes uh, natives, mm -hmm. and and disrupts the ecosystem. And if you compare a healthy native oak to a Norway maple, you'll find uh, 400 caterpillars uh, happily living on the native oak, and much less of the local insects are recognizing, for example, Japanese maple. Mm -hmm. So Japanese maple isn't a big problem. I have one in my backyard when I moved here and I left her because it's, it's not uh, taking over my backyard. A Norway maple, you'll just see them pop up everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's a weed. You need to go. And, and it, it takes a while to get used to thinking of a tree as a weed. It's still uh, purifying the air, but we want to plant with native plants that are, uh, have deep roots. So if you think of the Bradford pear, I don't know how many here have Bradford pear. It has really shallow roots. It's not deep rooted. It, it's the first tree to go in a storm. It doesn't serve our ecosystem. It's really a, a, a weed. It, it was planted for ornamental reasons. So we have to know what role a tree or a plant serves the, in the ecosystem and the big scheme of things. So it starts with feeding the caterpillars and the insects and, and that in turn feeds the birds and, 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 and the bees and the, we have, we, we have to, we have to be responsible in terms of planting what our local insect population knows. And that helps with pollination and then supporting life. So when I have um, a native plant that's, was actually sourced here genetically and that i really enjoy the long island native plant initiative it was a terrific job um, uh, in terms of just maintaining the the genotypes 
the identity of the plant has to be preserved and we must not get confused when we go to the nurseries there are cultivars and then there are nativars mm -hmm. and those may seem like foreign terms but what it really means is it not everything is what it seems and we must know what we're buying when we're buying it but when we buy the real deal you'll be rewarded you'll have butterflies and you'll have buzzing activity in your back and front yard and those plants are simply made to live here and they do great and they and they'll feed and support life uh, a side note that i'm really passionate about is when i moved to port washington that's where i live um, it really bothered me the mentality the lawn mentality of course because you don't see a lot of insect activity there but then um, the fact that people wouldn't leave their leaves, the insisting on a lawn and then bagging the leaves in plastic bags and then shipping them off with, uh, to the landfill where they may even be burned. So that type of thinking, we just have to cut into that and be like, no more. Mm -hmm. We melt the leaves, we leave the leaves, you let them be because they're restoring the soil and that, brings me to the bay, because this is uh, about the bay, um, never ever get high nitrogen water soluble fertilizers. It gives you a quick and easy solution to green, but we're paying for it right here in the bay. Right. And I'm a, I'm a big fan of, actually my, my husband is fifth generation clam digger, uh, and, uh, and I, I want to support the bay in any way I can. And uh, I'm researching options to support the kelp forests or oyster farmers and purifying the 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 bay but the first thing we do is we just become really picky and if you are uh, tempted to get the high nitrogen water soluble fertilizers just stop today I leave the leaves and they do the same <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure your blood is boiling right now because uh, our philosophy here at Save the Great South Bay is no fertilizer. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> I, I believe in in natural. Yeah, yeah. yeah. like yeah. like soil amendments, like um, just composting and then returning that as soil amendment, supporting whatever is growing there. Yeah. So. I would like to, um, we have a lot of questions, Christine, I can see from the chat bar, and I really want to make sure that we, we get to them. So I kept track of them all. So you want, to, you want to throw a couple of them out here and, and okay. we'll let our panelists answer them? Sure, I'm going to go back to the beginning. Barbara Hackett had the first question of the night, and she wanted to know, oh, wow, wow, there's been a lot of chat going on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so what native plants grow well in the shade garden and is cinnamon fern a native? Okay. Who would like to take that one? Lots of, lots of, uh, it depends on what, I mean, I, I for example, in my shady yard, geraniums from uh, Matt's uh, nursery have been doing really well. Geranium maculatum wild geraniums have been doing really well. Uh, the uh, foam flowers have been doing well. I mean, I kind of like them. They're beautiful in spring because they come out first, but now uh, they look a little raggedy. <laughs> I mean, I guess, you know, so it's, it's a little bit of uh, research. See what you like and what you want. Um, some, somebody had posted a list of resources, but I had also done that. Right? You could go to the Audubon's database. You could go to Doug Ptolemy database. There are a number of databases that you can sort and say, okay, I want a shade-loving plant that attracts butterflies that will grow in, you know, whatever, Long Island. And then you'll get a whole bunch of them and then you can do some research. Um, that's kind of like the easiest way to start. Uh, if you want a starter, I would say geranium maculatum. I like, the, I love the flower color. Have you, um, I'm gonna put you guys right on the spot, you're gonna hate me, but have you ever kind of gotten together and brainstormed like a list of resources that you could just send out by email to people so they could just click on the links really easily? Instead of trying to copy them down from a chat. Yeah, and Christine, we have a um, we we do have a list of resources on our website. It's Save the Great South Bay under Plant Bay Friendly. There's a, there's a list of resources there, including how you uh, the native plant finder, invasive plant identifier, and I'm sure Rewild Long Island also has a, a list of resources on their site as well. Awesome. Yeah. But let we me, can just me, follow yeah. up email to everybody with a, a list of resources, definitely. Just wanted to add one point um, to Raju's point about the shade garden. Um, a lot of folks think that um, their yard is shady and they need something that, you know, fern, something that can really live in a deep shade of a forest. Uh, but 
really a lot of these species, um, you know, things like woodland asters, um, they, they grow in uh, speckled light at the edge of a forest or even in a forest that doesn't have a, a dense canopy. Um, so the most typical like Long Island landscape, um, even if you have a kind of shady area in your yard, there is light, light during part of the day and even more things that are not necessarily shade plants will still thrive and do well and, or well enough if you have some light reaching the ground floor, uh, the understory at certain times of the day. So th that's just an extra two cents <laughs> that I wanted to throw in there. Thank you, Frank. I mean, I'll weigh in a little bit too. I, I had my mute button on at first. Um, you know, the, one of my favorite things to do on Long Island is to kind of walk through the, the different, the various forests that we have. Mm -hmm. And anytime you walk through a forest, that's where your opportunity to look at shade tolerant plants. I mean, if you take a hike, and you go into you know the Long Island Pine Barrens, for example, and you, you start walking through the groves of pitch pines and different oak species that we have out here, you'll find a tremendous amount of ground cover type species. I will say, uh, you know, typically it's just ground cover species that are deer at least tolerant or can at least bounce back quickly from being deer browse because we've lost all of our, our mid-story uh, coverage because of our deer populations on Long Island. But there's a tremendous amount of, of shade tolerant plants if, you, if you're looking for them, um, you know, just look at the ground covers when you take one of these hikes, but you'll find different types of ferns. Um, you'll find plants uh, like low bush blueberry and uh, huckleberry and, uh, you know, various other items that would just be naturally occurring. So pay attention when you're taking hikes, whenever you're looking for, you know, what would work good here, what would work there. Some of our naturalized areas are the best ways to determine what plants would be naturally occurring here, what are, you know, indigenous to these park regions. And, uh, and what are shade tolerant or, or, or slightly, you know, sun or, or, or salt tolerant, take, take some hikes. Great. I saw, Christine, I saw a great question about local resources for composting. This is something that's that like, yeah. come on my radar. And, um, and, um, and I'm wondering also from Frank and Hilda and Raju, Matt, do you know of any local, you know, what are municipalities um, doing composting programs? Or is it something that's done more on a commercial level? It's, it's something I really care about, um, the compost uh, aspect of things. And uh, I, I know in West Islip, due to COVID, they got uh, stopped. I don't know if Joy, Joy and Eric are here or someone is familiar with them, but they have a community compost uh, facility. This is the future, if we want to have one, is here in this book, the community scale permaculture farm and community scale compost systems. And we're not there yet, but we should be. So at the Science Museum of Long Island, um, here uh, in Plantum, next to Port Washington, we're going to set up a community compost pilot where uh, locals can come and learn how to compost and learn different methods to compost. It's a, th it's a simple three pin system, nothing, uh, uh, very technical about it really and everyone could be doing it and really should be doing it because the moment we ship our food waste out of the house we're adding to greenhouse gas emissions mm -hmm. and we just simply can't afford it so in terms of uh, shifting even tonight shifting from uh, this extractive mentality that's causing harm we turn towards regenerative methods so recovery in any which way you, it, it speaks to you. If you can take your food waste and create soil with it, you're already part of the solution. Yes, it doesn't take and, much to be a part of the solution, does it? No. Mm -hmm. and, and what's encouraging, uh, the meeting at the library, Rashu and I were there, it was a handful of us, maybe, that was just a couple of years ago, and and we thought about the single most important thing we could do as a community to be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and the thing that uh, really brought us all together was uh, how to treat the land we're on. And planting natives is the single most important thing you can do together with composting. So you're returning nutrients. You're, you're cutting into this uh, invasive extractive cycle where you're just a, a gluttonous consumer uh, and, 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 and everything matters. Every, every single thing we do matters. And there are ways to go about this. It starts with our thinking at the supermarket, uh, staying away from the single use plastics, uh, making sure that the products I buy aren't causing harm 
knowing the source. And, uh, and then we need to set up little educational uh, pods where you teach each other, teach each other, how do you compost? It seems so overwhelming to many, but it's so easy to do. You don't really need to be very technical about it, but once you show someone, they know how to do it. They like, they wanna, they wanna return to that. And just like that little meeting at the library grew from uh, a dozen interested into a movement here on the North Shore. And I believe, I, what are the latest counts to ask you? How many people do we have now? Yeah, so, so I mean, it, 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 I mean, you've grown from, I think, uh, initially there was seven people, and then the next year, 16 uh, people decided to do it, then 48. And this year, you know, we just launched our, I mean, it's exactly the same thing that Hildur say. I mean, that everybody has that same issue of how do I begin? Um, yeah. and, and, and you can, it, it, the point is, it's, we are talking about native plants generically. But if you think about it, a garden is a garden, and there are very many different designs and styles to your aesthetic. You can have a formal garden, you can have an informal garden, yes. a cottage garden, you can have a native, I mean, you can have a rain garden. There are so many different aesthetics you can bring to it. You can make a garden that just looks as formal as your neighbors, you know, whatever, roses and mums, right? Um, but you need an expert to help you sometimes to basically think through the process of how do I select the plant so that I have something blooming at different times? How do I make sure that I have the right light and the soil and, you know, so which is why, you know, there are two kinds of resources we, we, would, we would commend, or maybe three kinds, right? One is obviously the web databases and uh, lists that we're all talking about. They're on, our, on all our web pages. People can look through them. The second is experience. And this is very important. I think experiences of people who have gone through this who are our neighbors, who have looked at it in the first year and second year and third year and said, okay, this is what I liked and this is what I didn't like and this is what I would have done differently. So we collect stories and put them on our blog with, you know, eye candy, which is people's garden photos, because you can always steal their ideas and more important, learn from their mistakes. They say, oh, you know what? I planted thyme on, I removed my lawn and planted thyme, but then I wished that I had instead cardboarded and mulched and done that. Right? Mm -hmm. So then you know how it's going to look finally, what process they went through, where they got their resources and how they ended up doing it. So we have a number of those stories collected. And the third set of resources is expert advice, which is really, you know, being able to get affordable, expert, knowledgeable, reliable care. I mean, the tricky thing is Long Island is large. So if you want a consultation, somebody could be in a car an hour driving to your place and an hour back. And if they have to charge you for three hours, then you feel like, oh my God, this is so expensive, which is why we have to pull together and band together. And what we try to do is group people together. So if you reduce the amount of traveling time, reduce the amount of non-repeatable wasted time for the expert, be able to get them at group rates, so to speak, as a, as a completely all volunteer organization, we know the importance of time because, you know, I know Builder as a mom and, uh, and, uh, and a, a, a person in the workforce, he's balancing so many different things. So am I, am all of us are. So we really need, we can't, we can, we have so much bandwidth now left between COVID and murder hornets and whatever else to spend on our lawn. So how can we maximize that and get the greatest bang for the buck? So that's why we try to do things that are applicable. So all these three are important. Do your research online, learn from the experiences of others. And if you need to, get an expert, right? And then have them help you uh, with, with your problem. And, and I have to add, um, my neighbors, both next to me and across the street, sold their house recently. Um, not because of me, but <laughs> we were worried that my native plant garden was going to reduce the property prices because they're friends of mine. And we were honest about it because, you know, the standard uh, Gold Coast home has this, you know, lawn in front of it. And it's sort of like a real estate uh, pitch. Uh, but here is the good news. They sold for much higher than ever before. <laughs> so it didn't reduce the property value. It's actually, I, I'm going to take credit for this. That uh, they're actually, <laughs> well, it could be um, uh, the people moving in from the city, but, but their house is sold <laughs> for more. But I'll, I'm going to take credit. I said, it's thanks to my butterfly garden. People want to live next to us. <laughs> <laughs> it did not, um, because that's uh, what the first thing that people will worry about is, wait, is this going to affect my property value? If I get rid of the lawn, what's going to, you know, what will the neighbors think? And I'm happy to share with everyone here tonight that in Port Washington, it sort of like went from 
just a few houses sort of like the odd one out and now if you take uh, uh, if you drive around you'll see many rewild gardens and that changes the landscape so it changes the aesthetics and once people are educated if they see a dead lawn and nothing on it no bees no butterflies sort of depressing if you know what that means you want to support life right it's a very sort of fundamental drive to be here to support the pollinators so that life can continue and and right now people have had more time and and uh, because i'm a mom and a working mom at that i had to start small it doesn't have to be overwhelming i started with the strip between my dra driveway and the neighbor and that's a perfect place to plant milkweed for the monarch butterfly that's the backdrop here because the, the, the classic, the common milkweed can be quite aggressive, but it's very contained in that area. And sure enough, within, uh, in the next spring, uh, summer, there they came. And, and who doesn't want to live a life where you get in the car and here's the butterfly landing on your shoulder. And, and, then, um, and then we just added a little bit at a time and it's almost gone now. And everybody seems to love it. So I, I, I encourage anybody who's interested, just start with a little piece of land. And the good news is local nurseries are now offering native plants, thanks to Rewild Long Island here in Port Washington. You, were, you weren't able to buy locally native plants, but mm -hmm. things are shifting. They're listening. I agree, Hilda, oh, that, that things are yes. shifting. And it is, um, it, is, uh, it is something that once you learn, you can't unlearn it, right? Once you see something, you can't unsee it. So when I, when, uh, you know, I'm, I have a traditional Levittown lawn that is green and starts with the word Kentucky, which should be the first clue that it doesn't really belong here in New York. Um, and it's taken me a, a few months, but I see it now. And again, I think it's something that once you see, you can't unsee. And so you see all these duplicated lawns, they all look exactly the same and you're right, they're lifeless. And when you go to a place that has been rewilded or has been the habitat has been restored, you see you see the the insects, the caterpillars, the those little I don't even know what they are, Matt. Maybe you will know, or Frank, uh, the little orange bugs that we have here in our local uh, butterfly garden along the Carl's River. So, uh, Christine, how are we looking on questions? We have yeah, about so the next five bunch of questions left. are awesome because we obviously have a bunch of go-getters here. Yeah. Um, and you know, I know that this was basically about you know making our our yards friendly, but people have a lot of questions about places they identified, like their library perhaps, or um, somebody talked about Babylon and being along the streams, right. or um, how they can get grants and funding. Um, so I will just say for a little bit is that. If you're looking for grants and funding and people to partner with, um, look to your civic associations or just your civically minded organizations in your towns. Um, some of you have beautification groups, some of you have um, village improvement societies, some of you just have civic associations. And we're always looking for people to partner with and can sometimes and usually help with funding in, in some ways. So there's plenty of places for that to come from. Um, and then I think I'm gonna turn to you guys in terms of you just can't pick a spot and start ripping stuff out and planting things. A lot of times there's permits and there's you know other pieces involved. So I'm gonna let you speak to that. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, thank you, Christine. Absolutely. The best place to start is in your in your own home. Um, Frank, would you like to speak to any of that? Well, yeah, I mean, so it's definitely the best place to start is in your own home, but um, certainly educating local officials is incredibly important. Uh, the we, we keep going back to the village of Babylon. That was our original um, garden and uh, the mayor in Babylon and the trustees with Robin being one of them and the DPW, they're they're all on board now. They, they want to find places to plant native plants there. They like the idea of using um, shade tolerant uh, climax community species such as red maples to, to crowd out the Phragmites. So, you know, a lot of the times uh, it, it's, it's less about, um, you know, going and having to get volunteers, although that certainly helps, but it's often the times more about educating local officials and DPWs have, uh, have funds. They have, people with shovels and the ability to get things done there's funding with municipalities it's just about getting the word out there and and i think save the great south bay is just getting our legs under us truthfully i mean we, we've had a lot of um good work here rewild long island has has been at it for years 
Um, and, and if we can meet in the middle, really, and just help everybody understand. And, and one thing I would add, too, it's not just um, – it's not the municipalities. It's not the single-family homeowners, but also the developers, too. I have clients who are developers, and um, it's been cathartic to me personally as, a, um, as an environmentalist um, that they, they seem to actually care and have been responding as such. And, you know, kicking out the quintessential lawns and the, and the crepe myrtles that belong in South Carolina, but certainly not here, and putting things that are, are native to, to Long Island and will greatly increase the, um, the habitat value. So every little bit helps talk about it and, and just be about it. That's, that's, that's what I would say. Thanks. Um, Christine, we have about four minutes left. Sure. And, and I would like to say, I think a big part of what we're doing today is, um, is very helpful in making this movement grow and spread is sitting and having conversations. Um, that I think more often having conversations more often like this are very helpful. You know, things can tend to get lost on, on Facebook or online, but actually sitting down and having a conversation together feels like kind of getting back to our roots you know, that's what we're talking about here is connecting with people and connecting our roots. So if we, we have really just three minutes left, so I, I'd like to ask each of our panelists, I'm sorry if we didn't get to every question, but I'd like to ask each of our panelists for just some closing thoughts. Matt, can we start with you? Sure. I, uh, th I mean, first of all, I want to just thank you guys for bringing this type of awareness campaign to Long Island in general. Um, you know, I, I think the key takeaways here are, you know, the, the importance, but just the common sense aspect of sustainable landscaping, planting things and, you know, not just the right plant in the right place, but planting the right native plant in the right place. And so, uh, you know, I look forward to all the future conversations I have with both your organizations um, and with many of the, I mean, I see a lot of names that I recognize on here from all the questions I get uh, on our on our online website as well. So, you know, I appreciate all the support that everybody, you know, that's, that's joining us now and, and whoever will hear this uh, podcast as it's being recorded in the future. I appreciate all your support. Keep doing what you guys are doing. Keep asking the questions. Keep uh, pushing the needle. Keep bucking the trends and um, look forward to working with, with all you guys. Thanks, Matt. I really appreciate that. How about you, Hilda? Any closing thoughts for us? Yeah, I wanted to give a shout out to Catherine D'Amico. I don't know if she wants to pitch her plant sale. Is it still open? I have a question as a closing thought. I like being curious. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, hey, Catherine. So our plant sale, actually today, our fall plant sale, native plant sale was the last day was today. But if anybody on this call wants to uh, email me over an order, I'll added on tomorrow. Um, the list is on our website and I put that in the chat. Um, it's Theodore Roosevelt Sanctuary's website, ny.audubon.org, um, T-R-S-A-C. And um, I'll also say that we're having a workshop in partnership with LIMPI, uh, Long Island Native Plant Initiative. So that's gonna be on October 15th. Um, it's really geared toward landscape professionals, um, like our last couple of workshops, different topics. And um, we have Larry Wiener as our keynote speaker um, and Rusty Schmidt from Limpy and um, um, a couple of other speakers. So if that's on the website also, if you guys are interested, you can check out more info on that. Um, but yeah, this is an awesome, awesome webinar. I'm glad I jumped on while I was cooking dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Captain. Is your is your um, October fifteenth event? Is it in person or is it a Zoom? It's a Zoom. It's a half day workshop, and we're offering continuing ed credits, uh, master gardener credits, and um, yeah. But it's open to the general public too. And the last couple we did, we had a lot of um, just interested gardeners. And you know, there's a we're doing a question and answer panel at the end so that everybody gets the chance to ask all their questions. So. Terrific. Thank you, Catherine, so much. Thank you, guys. Thanks for all the work you're doing. Awesome. I'm going to get to you, Raju. Um, thank you. Uh, Frank had mentioned I am a trustee here in the village of Babylon, and, um, and I, I run the Conklin House, and we're be, we will be hosting a, a public event, um, also via a Zoom, with Cornell Cooperative uh, called The Magic of Composting. 
and I, I scheduled this. I know, Hilda, I knew you were going to love it. Um, I scheduled it from my own personal interest in learning how to compost um, and to be able to do it at my home, but also at the house, at the compound house. So feel free to join it. It's a free event. Um, it's a one hour conversation with um, Roxanne Zimmer over at Cornell Cooperative and her program is called The Magic of Composting. You can find it on Eventbrite. So Raju, can you, would you like to just wrap it up for us and give us your final sage words on, uh, on the, you know, on rewilding Long Island and how it will help our bay? Yeah, absolutely. And all I would say is, look, you can be overwhelmed by a lot of information and questions and this and that. Don't be, just be inspired by doing one thing. Pick one thing that is within your capacity to do and do it and you'll feel so inspired that come spring you plant that one plant it, or 10 plants or whatever is your like capacity and just come spring you'll just be delighted when it pops its head out and um the first uh, insect of the season comes by you'll feel like you'll feel like a, a million dollars or, or whatever <laughs> you want to feel like terrific I, so i have one one maybe final question it is fall is it too late is it too late to plant yeah. No. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> it's, it's the best time of the year, I, I think, to plant native plants because they have the season, um, a little bit of warmth left, followed by dormancy, and then so, some cool weather in the spring to get established before the first summer. Uh, best time of the year to plant by far is natives. And get some asters and some fall blooming beauties to put in. All right. Terrific. Well, thank you, everybody, so much for joining us tonight. The Zoom has been recorded, and we did download the chat, so we'll try and get back to answer any questions that we were not able to answer tonight. Um, we'll get the answers out to you guys. The, the Zoom will be posted to our Save the Great South Bay YouTube channel, and we'll share the link with everybody here. Thank you again for joining yeah. us, and good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Thank you.